Well, good evening. Happy Thursday to one and all. Hope there are many of you joining us this evening for our mystery wine blind tasting. This week, something red in our glass. Welcome one and all. Who's here? We've had a wonderful week thanks to uh, this beautiful weather that we were having a bit of a reprieve. So Kathy's with us this evening, the McCartys and Allison Leitman are watching. Thank you all so much for joining us. It's uh, super exciting to have you here. And Kathy Lang Liedemann is here too. Hi, Kathy. Good evening to you. Do you have the wine tonight? Or are you playing virtually, virtually? Um, here's the wine for those of you who don't have it. A red number. Trish, Andy, and Kathy, great. And Tran, hey man, how are you? Great to have you back with us this week. Megan's here for the first time. Megan Mayer, thank you very much for joining us. Kate Sandoff and Joanne's here. Todd, how are you, sir? It's great to have you with us. Craig Dock, Lorna and Craig are here. Matthew Simmons is, is with us. Isabel is here. Oh, good. Matthew Fitzsimmons is, is here. Hello. Good. And she, Kathy has the wine this week. Good. Great. Well, as others begin to chime in a little bit uh, and say that they're with us, we can start to begin to work this wine. Robert, how are you tonight, man? It's great to have you with us. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. I was um, chatting with a few folks this week and uh, we were talking a little bit kind of post the uh, wine buying event that we had here and the discussions that I got a chance to, with, uh, to, to have with folks at that event, talking a little bit about the scope of what we're doing and I was talking with one of uh, our consistent tasters and one of our Hestia Club members about building out some kind of platform that would allow for our collective knowledge to come together and be usable sort of on an app or something of that sort. And I was searching the, uh, today and I found this kind of for fun. Uh, wine Folly is a great resource and they have this red wine boldness chart um, that kind of gives you a general flow or spectrum as we've talked about in the past, this kind of general spectrum um, of light to robust. And this kind of outlines a general sense of you start sort of with Gamay and Pinot Noir and you work your way from a lighter bodied wine to a medium bodied wine to a more robust wine and the different varietals that you might find. It's by no means exhaustive, but I thought it was a nice visual. Uh, Matt and Kathy are here and the Swanbergs are here and I know I've just missed a number of you joining and thank you for that. I'm sorry, we'll catch up as you uh, venture further comments, but I wanted to give people the visual kind of of what I was talking about and by way of spectrum. So if that didn't make sense before, what am I talking about when I'm saying something is lighter bodied and I think about it on one side of a spectrum and more robust bodied on another side of the spectrum and we're talking about texture and weight of the wine um, and that's how, how sort of my mind begins to catalog wines and so even as we're just looking at this wine does it fall on the on the lighter side of things or more on the robust side and Isabel I agree wine folly is a great resource their, their pictographs and their uh, their information is presented visually in, in ways that are really helpful so um, another resource to look at. So let's begin to work on this wine. Hi, Susan. Uh, Michelle Williams Laskow is with us this evening. And Isabel, has, I think you've, Isabel, you've re referenced Wine Folly before in this chat, which has been great. Um, Chris, this is, this is your weekly sanity? That's awesome. Well, I, I look forward to helping you remain sane by virtue of a chat and some wine in a glass. So let's go. Someone noted already that it's red and that's appropriate. What else are we talking about here? From the color alone, just from the visual, what do you see? Is this tawny color? Is it ruby color? Is it purple color? How would you describe the color? And what do we know about this wine because of the color? We know it's red, so we can rule out a whole series of white grapes, that's easy. But what now can we get more specific about with respect to the color here? Susan's picking up deep purple. Maybe it's my hinting light, but I'm more ruby than purple. Um, I'm getting a little purple tinge. Uh, Kathy's throwing out deep ruby. Uh, very dark ruby is where Chris Shirley is at. Yeah, I think there's a little like purple cast at the rim on my wine. And um, I believe it was open for me just a few moments ago. So it wasn't necessarily uh, decanted. Uh, well in advance of the tasting like the Swanbergs are famous for doing. But Kathy's known in Deep Ruby, so we might be in uh, a pretty dark ruby camp with maybe a little purple inflection, 
Um, Susan's picking up more purple. Bobby just joined us. Hey, Bobby, how are you? Um, Todd's pointing out that's something you can learn from something from, from the visual uh, appreciation of the wine, right? It's youthful because he says he doesn't see much in the way of a browning quality. So there's not a tawny in quality, there's not a brown element, so this is likely a younger wine. And so when we get to the vintage call, if we were to say, mm, I think it's 10 years old, the color doesn't really back that up. It may be, maybe it'll be advanced on the palate and we think it's just a, um, an older wine that's holding up extremely well. But generally speaking, because of the color, we're thinking already this is probably two to five years old rather than say five to seven or seven to 10 years old. And so that's something we know. We haven't smelled it, we haven't tasted it. We already know a lot about this wine, which is pretty cool. So that deep ruby color um, would come from a light-bodied wine or a robust-bodied wine. Generally speaking, if you're looking at color and color vis-a-vis -vis the texture of the wine, the weight of the wine, would it be light-bodied if it's deep ruby into almost purple or purple flex into deep ruby? Would that be a light-bodied wine or a robust-bodied wine? Something in between. Where, do you, where would you place that? And that's something we can already start to build our profile of the wine and, uh, and see what we see. And then we can then work from that to figure out whether or not what we're thinking by way of the visual is what we actually perceive when we taste and smell wine. And hey, Rachel, cheers from New York. Um, sorry I don't have the wine, but really glad to have you with us this evening. Thank you for joining. Um, seen some really cool videos of you and uh, your wonderful travels for Oceano and the ability for that you have to, to taste that beautiful wine or those beautiful wines all around this great country. So um, Susan's uh, saying medium robust. And Sarah Walsh is also with us this evening. That's awesome. Hi, Sarah. How are you? And yes, Susan, I think medium robust is kind of a, a good call, right? So if this was a light-bodied wine, we might see a lighter color, more reddish cast than... So the ruby's kind of right, but it would perhaps be lighter ruby color, not necessarily so deep ruby, right? And so most of you have kind of noted that it's a pretty deep wine. Um, and Chris is noting that perhaps his abstinence of the week is making this all the better, but... It's a pretty good wine this week. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. I haven't tasted it yet, so I, I couldn't confirm that, but it certainly is. It has some lovely smells, and they're, they're changing from the first smell. My first, first whiff as I, I poured the glass before I, I pressed go on the video was that of a kind of a red fruit, raspberry bramble, kind of the stems of a wild raspberry kind of element, and it's kind of getting more. I haven't dove into the smell yet, but... Going back to the textural element and the visual, so we know that we think this wine is something that has a, a ruby kind of color to it, deep ruby, so it's got a rich and more robust potential profile to it. So we're not thinking something like Pinot Noir right off the bat. We might be thinking more something like, say, Syrah off the bat, just as a, a way to oppose those two varietals. Uh, and I'm not calling the Syrah by any means. I really haven't smelled it yet, but more robust. The color tells us that, right? What about the visual of the legs and the viscosity of this particular wine tells us about maybe climate, right? So the deeper and richer, the more robust refers to varietal. Um, deeper, richer color, I should say, might refer to a more robust wine. That might be varietal. And then we pick up perhaps more from the wine by way of its visual tells thanks to the amount of sugar or alcohol that's in the wine. And Matt Carroll's joining us tonight. Hey, buddy. Great to have you again. So awesome to have you with us. Kathy's noting that it has a fairly good amount of alcohol based on legs, right? So those legs, those formations of the wine as it swirls in a glass and then drops in tiers or legs that come down, the speed with which they form, the thickness with which they form, gives you an indication potentially of either sugar in the wine, so residual sugar or alcohol, and they're both related to that fermentation and ripeness. Um, and Stephen's uh, noting that Syrah is a good place to start, so I might have just gotten lucky uh, as I threw a varietal out there and made that not pigeonhole me into a varietal now that <laughs> it isn't. Um, so yeah, we're thinking about visually, just to kind of reinforce this one last point, visually we know that's deep kind of robust wine that has some higher alcohol and because of that, we're thinking probably a warmer climate. So if we get to the end, and we're off on a weird tangent and we say, I think this is Pinot Noir from a cool climate and it's 10 years old, we've not really adhered to what the wine is showing us 
by its visual presentation. So let's go on to smelling it. And Matt, it's awesome to, to have you uh, chiming in and helping the crew. I'm glad you're enjoying it too. Um, I'll have to get you some of the wines and then you can just ace them for us. All right, what do you smell, folks? Is it a pronounced smell? Right off the bat, like, and it, be kind of, it kind of centers you and makes you more present if the first element you work with with smell is not trying to identify the smells, but trying to identify whether or not it smells a lot or a little. And that kind of draws you in to, to the wine itself and to the moment and doesn't keep you kind of spinning and trying to wonder what this is. It draws you actually in and tries to help you focus uh, on what the wine is. I think sometimes for myself speaking, certainly for myself, in a blind tasting context, I'm, I get like ahead of myself going, what could it be? What might it be? Where, what is this wine? As opposed to actually just working the wine and allowing the wine to talk through or talk us through the actual profile. Um, and I'm not then so frantic. So just smelling it right now, it's, it's not a prominent prolific spell. It's not like just jumping out of the glass, but it isn't muted either. And so it's a medium kind of uh, profile of aroma, right? It's not, there's, there's an aroma there and it is present, but it isn't huge. And I, I always think back and I reference that uh, Australian Shiraz we had that, I mean, I walked in the room and it was in a decanter and I was like, well, I think we're having Australian Shiraz tonight. So the, uh, this wine is not that, but it is also not so muted and quiet that we have to work at it and, and need more time from it. Uh, all right, so what are we getting though? When you, uh, when you are sniffing into the wine, what aromatics are coming out? Remember the acronym FEW. Um, fruit, earth, wood. Uh, Doug Frost championed that little acronym for me, a great master sommelier uh, and a great educator, and fruit being any form of fruit, uh, and the quality of that fruit, the character of that fruit being underripe, to fresh, to dried, to cooked, to stewed, to candied, confection, all those uh, potential opportunities there for fruit. So the Swanbergs decanted this at six, so they're about an hour ahead, uh, and that usually allows uh, us a window into what the wine will become, and that's nice. So on the fruit side, are we in a kind of red fruit, a black fruit profile? Let's start there, and that's mostly oftentimes berry um, or pit fruit like cherries, and Kathy's throwing out black cherry, raspberries, a little bit of cola, so some of that candied fruit profile, and there might be some medicinal, medicinal element there, black pepper, which is really cool. Uh, brambly element is being echoed again, a reference to, uh, for my early comment. The cola tasting note, the ripe cherry, that's pretty cool. So we've got cherry, cola, pepper, and that black pepper element, yeah, is starting to come through for me, and that's a, a really good telltale sign usually for Syrah, and so maybe I did get lucky. Um, Christine, good evening, welcome. Okay, so warm climate, potentially, right? That cola element would suggest that. The alcohol and the color quality of this wine would suggest that. So we might be considering, or at least as we start to build this profile, we're thinking about a warmer climate Syrah. Uh, I just mentioned Australian Shiraz, and that's a warm climate Shiraz. Uh, Shiraz is a warm climate Syrah representation, but where else could we be talking about? Maybe South Africa, um, certainly California. Washington State. Um, where else, folks, would we want to consider? Susan, you're picking up eucalyptus? Oh boy. If you're picking up eucalyptus, we have to go back to Australia. Um, but maybe South Africa as well? There's a little bit of a black tea thing coming through for me and um, kind of a roasted lamb element. Uh, Just hinting through for that. Uh, it's not. It's not by any means the most pronounced profile, uh, but a little bit there. <laughs> Isabel's asking if we want a charcuterie plate right now, and if so, then that's a good telltale sign that you have Syrah in your glass. And I think that's there's a real chance, real chance for that. Hmm. Is there a for anybody else kind of a a fresh herb element? Um, I'm not sure how to describe that. I'm, I'm working on that one. But there's a, a fresh woody herb. 
it's not as strong as uh, as rosemary. It's um, but and it isn't as kind of clear as thyme, but there seems to be that. So Sarah's uh, really echoing or confirming and reaffirming for us the idea that the descriptors we're throwing out there is is very Sarah like. So Sarah, I'll throw to you or Matt. You know, if we're talking about these profiles, uh, where would you be considering Syrah then? Um, what particular place? Bay leaf. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, like bay leaf. I was try like it was a compressed green uh, in my head, in my visual, in the front part of my in my mind. I was seeing something flat and green, um, and not as not as prolific and volatile as um, you would get from sort of thyme and from rosemary. So bay leaf is a great call. Thank you for that. Um, hmm. Nicole, you're saying we got a blueprint for France on this one. So we, we would definitely be talking about France and the Northern Rhone, perhaps. Um, so maybe we're talking about Crow's Hermitage um, as an appellation. That would be that. So Johnny's with us and Lori too. Great guys. Hey, welcome. Um, yeah, and Matt, you're, you're correct. Matt's making a comment for me uh, back on the bay leaf idea that took a long time to get to it. It's resinous. Um, it is, um, and, but not overt. Uh, and fresh bay, like if you put bay in something, sometimes it takes over, but other times it just has a subtle quality to it. And this is, just has a little fresh bay note to it. Um, which is really pleasant. Uh, so it's, it's, this is a very, it's almost very expressive, but not overtly so. There's a subtle notes, subtle notes to this. And, um, and Nicole's noting, Nicole and Stephen are noting that they think this is Southern France. So yeah, we're talking about the Rhone Valley perhaps um, in the way of Syrah typically. Um, and Yumi's watching, thank you. Um, and this tastes familiar. So let's get to taste. Oh, and sorry, it smells familiar. Gotcha. Yeah, it does smell familiar that way. All those spice elements, we were talking about a warm climate and we were kind of venturing perhaps more toward the new world. And in the new world, I don't necessarily get some of those notes typically. It would be really exciting to try a wine from the new world. Um, uh, an old friend, Claude, um, from Soliste, for example, he makes a Syrah from Sonoma that has some of these secondary qualities. Um, we wouldn't be drinking that particular wine in this format um, and for this price. But yeah, it's uh, pretty cool that, yeah, there's a possibility here. Maybe we're drinking, uh, yeah, Northern Rhone. Matt's asking, are we getting kind of that uh, uh, olive tapenade element that would be kind of re representative of um, Northern Rhone Syrah? And let's find out. Craig's pointing out that pointing out, excuse me, Craig, I'm salivating. I couldn't enunciate that this has moderate tannin, high tannin, excuse me, and moderate acidity. And I think this is a great example of where tannin and acidity interweave to be kind of confusing, parsing them out. I think um, you could reverse your call there um, with big tannins and medium acidity, or high acidity and medium tannins. Um, because they're both playing really in concert. Um, and that's really interesting. I think the, uh, the profile of the, the flavor, excuse me, of the, the palate, so the taste of this wine is giving you some medium plus tannin, medium plus acidity. And that's my way of kind of couching between the high one and low and medium the other. I think they're, they're both there. I'm still salivating. It's pretty, pretty high acidity, the tannins, are not super bonding to my gums off first taste. I'll do it again here in a second and see if we get anywhere further, but. The Millettes rightly noted that they don't think this is necessarily straight Syrah. Um, this might be talking to blend. I'm not getting a whole bunch of olive, maybe a little olive pit. Um, and I think that's kind of 
present, but it isn't like the olive tapenade, garlic, onion, olive oil, olive blend that um, would be more of a, a straight tell. Um, and there's a, a little bit going on on the palate, isn't there? Yeah. Kathy's throwing out GSM. GSM standing for Grenache and Syrah and Morvedra. And Tony Brooks and Sharon are now watching with us. Hey guys, welcome. Super excited to have you with us. There's more of that bay leaf herbal element that's coming on. And Sarah's helping us in referencing the fact that uh, the more muted uh, aroma and, and kind of aromatic profile is a good tell for this not being 100% Syrah. Um, and maybe this is a nice kind of GSM or Rhone blend. Uh, GSM is an abbreviation, as I said, for Grenache Syrah Morvedra. And GSM is associated with the Southern Rhone. In particular, most Chateau Neuf de Pop wines are made with GSM, but most Cote de Rhone wines are as well. But there are other varietals that you could splash into that kind of blend as well. Claret being another one. Um, so there's a great chance that we're talking about Grenache and Syrah and Morvedra, and we're picking up some of those Syrah notes on the nose, but we're picking up other notes and other things on the palate. So what are you tasting? Let's go back to fruit, earth, and wood. Fruit-wise, what do you taste on the palate? Mm -hmm. It's not inky black, you know, it's not super powerful. The fruit's a little bit more tart. And the Swanbergs, Jeff, Jeff Swanberg and Nicole are pointing out that the Morvedra piece seems to be missing. So if this is Rhone, it's kind of lacking that, that more deep brooding, darker quality. Um, and I don't see that in the Morvedra here. And yeah, of course, it's more raspberry. Um, it's a great question to, to Sarah's question there. What's the alcohol? Where's the alcohol at? It's a little bit warm, huh? Are you guys picking up a little bit of uh, the retro nasal? Um, it's a tiny bit hot on the palate, especially kind of with the lightness of the, uh, of the overall profile, kind of the, the red raspberry raspberry element, light cherry element on the palate, and the, the, uh, the tannin and the acid being what they are. They're kind of, this wine is not as big perhaps on the palate as we might have thought by way of the visual. And Susan just noting that too, the ABV is not as high as she anticipated. It's, it's probably still 13.5, 14%, um, but not necessarily huge. And the wine isn't particularly fleshy. Um, Chris has thrown out um, a Grenache Syrah blend, but possibly Merlot too. And that's an interesting call. Some people earlier, and I don't remember who put it out there, but put out Plum. And Plum's a great call for Merlot. Hmm. Do we still think this is kind of warm climate? Visually, we were thinking that. And then we kind of went to France, and now we're tasting it. And do you still think we're in a warm climate or more of a cool climate? And can that help us direct to a place? And maybe when we arrive more in a place, we can start to think again about the varietals. You could get a blend like that. You're right, Sarah. Sorry for my pause there. I was lost in some thought. The, the tannins here are what, what I'm kind of wrapping my head around. You could get a blend, as Sarah's saying, that we're talking about from Washington. There isn't a plushness to that, to this wine. It would have to be a very early pick in Washington. Kind of that irrigated 300 plus days of sun, Eastern Washington profile would be warmer and riper, I think. Um, I'm, I, I'm maybe I'm, I'm going against the grain here because I'm getting warm from, from folks. Uh, the Swanbergs, I think, were throughout warm. Um, definitely more old world. And Susan's asking about any tertiary characteristics, which is a super wine word. I love that word. Uh, but it's a confusing word in that people think tertiary means third or kind of the third level of experience. And it means secondary or aromatics. And it means things that are not fruit oriented. And yeah, for me, the, a lot of that 
was the bay leaf, was the herbal element, was a little bit of tea quality. Um, there was black pepper on the nose. I'm not giving that on the palate. The palate's not quite as expressive, and this is where 25 minutes in, it's time for it to kick into another gear, and we'll see. I'm gonna pour myself a little bit more. Each time I've done that in the past, the wine becomes more expressive. So let's see if that happens. Oh yeah, wow. I'm back to that kind of um, air-dried meat, brajola kind of, uh, wow, yeah, tons of that. This is meatier, which definitely would take me more old world per Chris's comment. And to your question, Susan, a ton more tertiary elements. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's charcuterie plate for sure, which definitely can kind of reflect then back to that idea of some Syrah. Matt's question about pyrazine, and we've talked about pyrazine before, but just in case you don't know, pyrazine usually relates to the Cabernet family, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, Cabernet um, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, excuse me, um, giving a green quality, something that is sort of um, grassy green, peppery green, bell pepper, uh, maybe even a little bit of um, kind of jalapeno pepper sometimes. But no, per Susan's point there and Kathy's comment back, no pyrazine here for me either. The tannin is interesting, it's astringent. Um, it's not juicy, it's very drying. It's kind of like Nebbiolo tannin. I don't think we're drinking Nebbiolo um, based on the profile, but the tannins, the tannin and the acid, as it, we noted in the beginning, reflect a little bit more of a cool climate to me, which is interesting um, because it's just a little bit more restrained. There's a meatiness to this too, which is, you know, maybe we're talking about that Grenache Syrah blend. And so maybe we're talking about kind of a, a crew uh, in the Rhone, a Rhone crew like Karen or Vakiras or Gigandas or a place where they're not making just a, a GSM per se, but they have really good Grenache and they have some really good Syrah and they're making um, a specific place reference there. And I believe we've had one in the past. Um, so we could be doubling back. Now some 30, 30 go-rounds of this, it, it's very possible we're repeating some at least different places in the world. Um, but that, those places in the Southern Rhone would have kind of a conversation about warmth, generally. Um, ah, great. I'm sorry, I'm reading the, the note from Nicole and Stephen, who are noting that they're wondering whether the tannin might be coming from Sanso or Carignan, blended with the Grenache and Syrah. And there is where you could you skip the Grenache, the Mervedra, and you might get some of that Sanso. Sanso can have that really um, kind of sinewy tannin. Um, it's like wiry tannin, it's, uh, I use sinewy, but like muscular tannin that if you think about the body with no flesh on it, just that you can see the, the muscle pulling, um, that's sort of this, it's um, guitar string tannin that you can kind of pluck at, um, and it, it can be resonant, but wow. Um, yeah, which Sarah's saying that she thinks it's, it sounds like Saint-Combe uh, les, uh, les Deux Allions, which is like a baby gigondas. Um, so it could be a Cote de Rome that is in that realm. I don't think we'd go wrong in any way by calling a Syrah element and a Grenache and a Carignan or um, something like that, Sanso in particular. Um, we've been in Spain before and tasted those same varietals. Um, but I'm not, as Tony says, it just doesn't taste Spain to me. You know, like you, you don't put your nose in this, you don't taste this and go, Spain. Uh, I'm definitely more um, in France than I would be in Spain. I don't think we're in Italy necessarily, unless we're drinking a very interesting blend from the northern part of Italy. The blend is sort of resonating with a lot of us, which is really cool. Um, what about, say, Austria? Should we consider something cool climate like Austria um, and I think generally speaking, unless it was, we were kind of heading down the Merlot route, I'm, I'm not sure that that would be the case. Um, Christine's joining us. Hey, Christine, how are you? Hi from Michigan. 
Um, Chris is noting that this is very French, and Jonathan, hey man, welcome aboard. Thanks for coming in tonight. The, um, yeah, this does grow more and more into uh, the sort of French camp, um, and maybe we're talking uh, a little bit cooler quality to a particular vintage, but it still has alcohol. Like, I'm still getting a little bit of burn from it. Um, it's not wildly hot, but it is higher alcohol. There's a density on the palate that is the acid, the tannin, and the alcohol, and there's an odd like lack of fleshiness to go with those things. So it, it seems like we're seeing the skeleton of the wine and not necessarily the full body of it. Um, and I don't know if that's just because it's a tiny bit youthful, as we noted in the beginning, because of the color, that it wasn't necessarily an older wine, but this has a little bit more yeah, it's just um, that meatiness puts me in a pretty comfortable call for the round. And David's echoing Chris's comment and saying French. And hey, Jonathan, yep, it's been a week. I'm glad to have you back, man. Thank you for joining us. So Jeff Swanberg's thrown out there, maybe it's just Grenache Plus. And, um, or he's asking the question, excuse me, I didn't see the question mark. Grenache Plus what? So Grenache, Syrah, Carignan, Senso. Um, we could definitely uh, talk about this wine in those, in those contexts. I think that's a fair way to describe this particular wine. So broadly, we could just kind of say Cote de Rhone. Um, and I would say Cote d'Ivoire village. I mean, some of some of these villages that have this character, but could get more specific. And um, so, you know, Rasto, Gigondas, Vakiras, Lirac, Karen. There's more, um, but Gigondas and Vakiras, uh, Rasto. Rasto seems to be a little bit more rustic and a little bit more weighty. And the limited experiences I've had with Rasto, Gigondas gives you more Grenache, quality Grenache. Um, generally less Syrah maybe, um, but um, Vakiras has a little more angularity than Gigondas does to me. In my mind, Gigondas just is a little bit more ballooned, but Matt, Kathy, anybody else chime in here if I'm, I'm describing these wrong, Sarah. Um, Lirac can give you kind of, I think a, a lighter, a skeleton-like and a more anemic profile on the wine. Um, Karen, I've tried a few recently and those are beautiful. Um, let's see. Um, so yeah, I think if we just wanted to broadly say kind of Southern Rhone profile, uh, that's where I'm certainly headed and I think we should consider others. But Jonathan's asked me a question and I will answer it real quick and then we'll come back to this. But asking about the cabanas that we have outside and whether or not they're still available, they are for this week. We will close them on Monday for a number of, uh, for a period of time, uh, yet to be determined, but they're closed because we're going to re rebuild them. So we had tents out there at this point, really, essentially, and the weather has proven that uh, the tents won't last through the winter. And so we're going to build physical structures with roofs and some sidewalls and heaters and ceiling fans, and we're going to put some pavers down to make the walkway a little bit more, um, more viable. And once we get that all done, which will hopefully take a couple weeks only, we'll open them up again and we will be open throughout the winter outside as well as inside and with our to-go. So thank you for the question, Jonathan. Um, so I missed a little bit there, but I think we've talked, there's a little bit of discussion perhaps with languedoc Roussillon, um, Southern France. Um, and that's an absolute possibility. Um, And you could get some older Karen, I mean, Carignan, excuse me, and some older Senso. You know, you could be um, in the Languedoc for sure and, and be down that way and have this tannic structure. So maybe we're talking about something like Minervois. That'd be pretty interesting. Get some Syrah, get some Grenache, get some Carignan, some old line stuff. Uh, rustic, because this isn't exactly polished, um, but 
it is structured and interesting. So yeah, I mean, I think guys were in Southern France and the Rhone would be an okay call um, for sure. I don't think you'd get dinged on points for that. But I think part of what we talked about in the initial phase is too, some of that darker element and that deep ruby would be more explained perhaps by kind of a, a deeper uh, skin quality kind of developed by way of the ripeness that would come from from the, uh, the southern part of France, more south than the Rhone. And yet, maybe on an elevated spot, it's not ripening phenolically in the same way, and so you're not getting that jammy profile. You're still maintaining that acid and the tannin while the skins are still getting some of that pigmentation by way of the, the ripeness, or by way of the sunshine that's there. So, um, Kathy, to your question about the, the formal cabanas, um, we don't know exactly yet. We're starting the construction on Monday, and once we know more about how the timetable will go on those, we're hoping for a couple weeks. So we're hoping by the end of November, um, but not necessarily sure about how that will go. Um, and Isabel, yeah, I've had a few different Mino Bois, but not a ton, and they are drastically different, so it's hard exactly to, to nail that. And David, to your question about not polished. So the tannin and the acid on this wine are a little bit rustic. The vine material might not be super old. The, the winemaking here is true and honest, I think, but not necessarily um, a super elevated site. And by that, I mean a quality site, a site that is pristine and has been established because people know that great fruit is produced there. So a lesser site relative to a Grand Cru site, for example, or a, a delineated designated site. Um, this is an area where they're maybe still figuring out how to, to farm it or, um, or it's a just more challenging site. Um, I think that's kind of one of the things I'm talking about where it's not quite as polished. Um, I like the wine. I like. I don't look for polish necessarily in a wine, but there are some wines that have soft, round edges that um, the wine is complete and totally knit together. And the youth of this wine and the overall experience of it suggests that it's not quite as polished. Um, well, Kathy, if you would like to, to celebrate with us, that would be wonderful to celebrate a big decade birthday, a, a monumental, important birthday. We would be honored to have you. Um, feel free to, to chime in, uh, to, to, uh, to ping us at any point. We'll be putting up notifications about the construction on Facebook and Instagram and things uh, to kind of just show you where the progress is. And then once we get a clear sense of when we can open the books, we will and we'll let you know. Um, it is pretty young. So Languedoc, I like the, the Millet's idea of having some, um, some Carignan Sanso, some Grenache, some Syrah. Let's talk a little bit about the Grenache. Um, the Grenache is gonna give us some of that acid perhaps. Um, Sometimes some of that blue fruit. And I'm not getting any of that, but. <laughs> we will happily celebrate whatever birthday you want to designate as the birthday we're celebrating. 40, no problem. Um, And Chris, yeah, some burgers to go for a while. We'll still have the uh, front patio open for some outdoor seating for those of you that want that. But um, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna pause for a moment in order that we can continue to be outside for a longer period of time. So we appreciate everybody's patience with that. All right, what do you think, folks? Should we call this? Languedoc, kind of red, Grenache, Syrah, Carignan, Sanso. So a Rhone varietal blend, perhaps coming from some higher elevation site um, that isn't mountainous per se, but a hillside that is in the, in the southern part of France in that kind of Mediterranean arc uh, where you'll find the Languedoc and Roussillon. Um, yeah, it would be pretty tasty with a, an umami burger right now. All that bacon jam, uh, I would, yeah, that would be nice with this. So, all right. I'm comfortable with that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going with where everybody kind of took us, and I think, um, yeah, that's pretty awesome. Let's stay there. So let's say 2018, kind of a Southern French red, Syrah Grenache, Carignan Senso kind of blend. Um, Isabel, thank you so much for your comment. Yeah, we are 
we are inspired by all of you. Our efforts are in direct response to you in our attempts to try to make sure we can continue to fill our mission of using food and drink to form connections and build community. And we're going to do whatever we have to do to be able to continue to fulfill that mission. So that involves us building out the cabanas to be more viable throughout the winter months. So we're going to have our own variation on apres ski, right? We're not skiing necessarily, but you can come on out and have a meal and, uh, and relax in the cabanas and, and drink some wines like this. So yes, I'm going, uh, I'm going that route. Anybody else want to put a different flag in the sand and call something different? I'm reaching for the bottle. Here we go. Oh, cool. <laughs> awesome. Vintage wrong. 2019. So this is really a baby, but it's Mirabois. This is Bastide Chateau Coupe Rose. They make some wonderful wines. And here's the deal. This is 48% Carignan. 48%. 46% Grenache and 6% Syrah. So we picked up some Syrah notes but it just wasn't there on the palate. And carrying on has all that kind of crazy, uh, intense um, kind of uh, tannin, this, this sinewy tannin. So way to go, um, way to go, Millette's for kind of throwing that out there. And yeah, this will get more fruity and this will get kind of, this will open up, this needs, this is a baby. These are some beautiful wines. We carried for a period of time a wine from them called Lorient's. Um, which we'd love to get back. I gotta get back, back in the house. And it was, a, that was about a year or so plus ago. And the present vintage was 2012 and it still tastes like a baby. They, their wines age beautifully. So if you enjoyed this, drink it. But if you wanna pick up a couple bottles and throw them away in, a, in the corner of a cellar and forget about them, I bet you anything they're gonna provide kind of a lengthy enjoyment in three, five plus years. Um, yeah, this is a total baby and a fun one. Cool. Yep. So, um, look, let me let me just read the back here because it's super descriptive and, and we kind of nailed it. Um, Coupe Rose farms a hundred acres in small plots high in the upper Minervois, managed with verb by the family of Francois Le Ch uh, Calvez, excuse me. They make wine born from vines growing in limestone soil. So limestone doesn't give you as kind of fleshy or as expressive a wine. So more skeleton. Um, amid fragrant underbrush of Mediterranean hinterland. Bastide, referring to a, a fortified farm, is a, a blend of Carignan, Grenache, and Syrah, and it's dark, richly scented, and full of herbal spice flavors found in the mountainous region. And that's exactly what we, uh, what we describe. So that's pretty cool, guys. Way to go. It is a great wine at that price point. Um, It'd be a good wine with even 10 or $15 more on that, but um, really cool wine. So excellent, folks. Well done. Cheers to all of you. We'll see you this week uh, here. If you're joining us, a couple of you I know are, and I look forward to seeing you in person. And for those of you that uh, we won't see this week, we will see you again on Thursday. Take care. Cheers.